Today on The State of Us, voters dread the 2024 election and the GOP is changing its big business tactics. According to the Wall Street Journal, polling now suggests that a substantial majority of Democrats don't want Biden to run for office again. While Trump remains the dominant force within the Republican Party, many say they're open to someone new who doesn't bring the former president's combative divisiveness or the distraction of a grueling court battle. And no one claims that Biden at 80 years old or Trump 77 represents the youthful vigor or embodiment of America's bright future that many have found appealing in past presidential candidates. So today we'll be looking at uh, both voters dreading the 2024 election with the likely current uh, nominees, and also the GOP changing some of its big business tactics. Welcome to the State of Us. I'm your host, Justin T. Weller, joined today by the one and only, your friendly redneck liberal and the senior resident historian here at True Chat, Mr. Lance Jackson. Getting ready to talk some politics. I like it. I'm all pumped, ready to go. Um, since I'm so much younger than Biden and Trump, I, I, I told her- <laughs> You're a spring chicken by, uh, by comparison. To you could bring that youthful vigor to the office. I, I could. Much, <laughs> very much needed. I, I like the opening there because, boy, really? We're going to elect somebody who's going to be almost 82 or almost 79 to president? I mean, I'm really glad that, cross my fingers, things will change before the election. I mean, I don't know about you, but... I sure hope that I feel like running for president when I'm 80 or 82, because I, I, I mean, my, both of my grandparents on my father's side lived to be, um, upper eighties, you know, and I great. And they were pretty with it the whole time, but I don't think that either of them would have said that they thought it was a good idea for them to run for, I don't think either would have, either one of them would have said that they want a full-time occupation at 80, let alone, you know, a job that requires something like 60 to 80 hours a week at minimum, if done lightly. Hey, I just read an article. <laughs> you know what the fastest growing age group is at work? What's that? People in their 80s. Well, there there it is. I, mean, I guess, to, I to, guess to, there's to, a lot of that, vibrant 80-year-olds. Well, there, there are. And they're like, you know, I'm tired of, I got tired of playing golf every day. I sure. got I got tired of you know, volunteering at the nonprofit. Hey, my wife kicked me out. You know, <laughs> I can only ride my bike so many miles a week. You know, I'm up to 200 miles a week on my bike. Oh, what else? What else do I do? I'm going back to work. So yeah. in, in deference to them, that was an article that mm. I read. Uh, I think it was in the wall street journal from last week. I guess if we have, they're, they're some, talking about 80 year olds, some 80 plus year olds out there. Hey, if, if, you're, if you feel like you're up for running for president, please reach out. Cause I, I mean, I, I would like to meet these people. I, I don't doubt that there are people that can do it. Warren Buffett's working into his eighties and, Right. Runs one of the biggest wealth companies in in the world, so maybe he should run for. So president. maybe, well, you know, <laughs> so maybe we're wrong, right? Are we casting aspersions on these on these? Are we, are we practicing some ageism here? Well, I I really don't think that the or majority is it these two people. I, right? Yeah, I was were, gonna say I really don't think that it. I don't think the main reason that people are not excited about these two candidates is their age. Do I think? I mean, clearly. Right. And we talked about this actually in the 2020 election, because that one of the themes was these would be either of these people by the time they leave office would be the oldest people to ever hold the office of president. You know, is that a big deal? Obviously not, because like it was either going to be Biden or Trump. And in either case, you were going to have somebody that was, you know, up there in years. So clearly that's not a. It's something that's going to keep somebody from becoming president. I think what the article is highlighting is that part of what's gotten us excited as a, as a nation about different candidates in the past has been youthful, energetic candidates. And when we say youthful, remember, it's relative. When you're talking about somebody who's 80, youthful, for example, could be somebody like Lance, you know, but realistically, it's people that have been, you know, in their 40s or early 50s. Well, and it's like, know, wow, look at that, that energy, you know. And historically, too, when you when you mention that, usually you don't run against a sitting president. No. You know, so, I mean, you know, is Gavin Newsom waiting in the wings for Biden to, you know, 
stumble figuratively. You know, he stumbled literally, you know, a couple well, weeks yeah. ago. Um, but, and, and even challenge. I mean, the last, was it, you know, John Anderson ran as an independent <laughs> against yeah, Carter think, in say, 80. You have we to going, go pretty far are back. Going, are we going back to 68 when McCarthy and Robert Kennedy yeah. ran against Lyndon Johnson? And Johnson, the last time that and Johnson pulled out, Johnson, a young didn't, insurgent candidate tried. Right. But when young insurgent candidates have been successful, it's almost always been like, well, you go back to Obama, right? It's almost always been when their party was not the one that had held the White House previously. So they weren't running against an incumbent. No, that's my point is so. Yeah. Well, and the Biden thing's extra complicated because this is. I mean, he's seeking a second term, right? So why it's is not nobody even... saying that? I mean, I just am I having an, an epiphany here, or am I missing something? Nobody's bringing up 1968 because LBJ was thought to be right. the shoe in nominee for the Democrats to run for re-election after winning the election in '64 to re-elect in '68, and Eugene McCarthy and Robert Kennedy ran. Against him, threw their hats in the ring. And in New Hampshire, the bellwether, right, the start yeah. of the – Johnson won the primary but only garnered like 52% of the Democratic vote. And so he went on TV and said, I'm not even going to bother to run. So, I mean, if somebody were to challenge Biden on the Democratic side, would Biden bow out? I mean, right now there's not even a challenger. But that's the last time I can think of right. a challenger – to why, the incumbent why president. Is there, I, I do. Why is there not? I mean, I know why. Whereas the Republicans, you've got like 17 names. Right. Right now. I mean, yeah. there are like 17. Seriously, folks, it's it's double right. digits. I don't know if it's 17. So it's like 2016 again. Yeah. <laughs> but there wow. are people who have formally announced. These yeah. aren't, they don't have their committees and uh, right. looking into whether the or not they should run. People think they're running for they president. They actually are they're, running, right? Yeah. For the Republican side. So, okay, we, we get that. But- but that's not unusual for the side right. that doesn't have. But it is very unusual for somebody to challenge an incumbent. Yes. And well, that's why. Why is there not a challenger to Biden yet? And uh, the answer is because historically, right, and historically recent history tells us that people don't usually well, you say challenge. Sixty eight's not recent. I remember sixty eight. Yeah. Well. Okay. <laughs> There's that relative. It's 1968. And we're not you're, talking about 1868. You're, you're, uh, oh, okay. We're talking about 1968. Oh. Well, I mean, you were alive for both, right? So I, I was. Okay. <laughs> I can't help it if you're too young to remember things. <laughs> That's it's like you know, compared to Biden, you're youthful. But you know, and then if you compare you to Levi, I Levi's seems youthful. So, but then if we compare Levi to uh, you know, a two-year-old. Levi doesn't remember 2008. Well, much yeah. less 1968. I know. <laughs> I mean, heck, the other day you didn't even know who Timothy Leary was. That's so that's I, all so these I, people. I, I'm really getting old because you guys don't even get my cultural references anymore. Yeah, that's one of those. See, there's old people courtesy, right? Smile so does, so and does, laugh along. So does Gavin Newsom? I mean, he, is he the is he is that is that the best? We got, I mean, governor of California. I mean, the biggest challenger to Trump is the I, governor yeah. of Florida. Yeah. Yeah. But the Democrats, I, mean, I had a friend who just returned from vacation on the shores, on the Gulf shores of Alabama uh -huh. and political action sign, right? Campaign sign. First of the season said, I'm voting for DeSantis, Trump without the crazy. I mean, I think that's what DeSantis is going for. I mean, in fairness, and younger, to that campaign, right? Is, he's in his, is in his, you're you're gonna get you're gonna get the policy of Trump without the age and without the same degree, the drama of drama. You know, I think that's the. I mean, that's the angle. At least it seems like is being taken. Um, they haven't said that explicitly, but the article goes on, Lance, to say that. Well, who else runs from the Democrats if it's not Gavin Newsom? Somebody new and exciting. I mean, you can't throw Hillary back. Yeah, but who do the Democrats have? <laughs> well, I don't think that Hillary would count as new and exciting. No. Well, it would be exciting. No, it but, would be but exciting, who else, but it wouldn't but be But who new. else do the Democrats, who's the young up and comer? Uh, well, that the problem, see, here's the problem. I mean, you want to talk about something that Biden did, right, that was keen, is the people that could have been good options, he's either given a job to or done favors for. 
So he's basically wiped out. I mean, like you think of, you know, some of the other candidates from uh, 2020 that that some people were actually genuinely excited yeah, I mean, about. You have, you have Amy Klobuchar, and right. Pete Buttigieg. And- but like, well, Pete Buttigieg is the transportation secretary, so he ain't going to, yeah, I mean, you're not going to step up and challenge, you know, your boss. Some of the others are probably known factors, so they don't count as exciting. And you, you got Beto down in, oh, down that's in right. Texas. He might be trying I, I again. I mean, he, he's kind of like, you know, <laughs> uh, I hate to put these two names together, but <laughs> see, like Abraham Lincoln never wins an election until he runs for president. Right. Well, maybe. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I know Lincoln was, you know, in the Illinois Congress and, you know, all yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah, but, but, you know, he, he lost the Senate race in 1858 mm-hmm. yep. and then became president then became in president. 1860. It can happen, folks. Now I'm going back to the 1860s. Oh, okay. I just wanted to make that reference. Back to the good old days. Since you knew, yeah, since you made the comment. Okay, Civil War and That all I that. lived yes. in both, <laughs> yeah, the 1860s and 1960s. I collect a lot of books from the 1800s. And when I get to 2060s, then we're going to have a... We're going to have a show. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be impressive. Uh, so the, the article points out, and I think this is really important, just how close it was in 2020, because we don't remember. I, I don't know if we recall that it was close. You don't remember January 6th? Well, yes, I so do. I, I, obviously, I, it was- but that, I don't know. Does it being close have anything to do with whether that would have taken place or not? Oh, you don't think so? I, I do. So you mean you think if, if the Electoral College had been a wide margin- it wouldn't have. January 6th would not have occurred. No, so, I, I, I believe that. If 2020 is any guide, and if the two ultimately top their tickets come election day, referring to Trump and Biden, it will be a razor thin contest. Biden's margin of victory in 2020 in the states that decided the election was less than 77,000 votes across four states, although he won the popular vote by seven million. So as a lesson here and a reminder, but, but right, wasn't it the same thing in 2016 when Trump won? Yeah. Wasn't it less than a hundred thousand votes? The di- in, well, the difference was that he didn't three states. He and, lost the popular vote, but won the electoral. But it was still a very razor thin margin yes. by, yep. by which he won. Yes. It, well, it has been. And that's part of the, I guess, part of the thing is the article points out that few voters appear confident that 2024 will be about the issues that many of them care about or that the polarization that has gripped the country will abate. It goes on to explain that when pollsters asked in 2010 whether the country had become so divided that the national government can no longer solve major issues, 45% agreed, while a larger share, some 50%, said that the nation could unify despite its partisan differences. NBC News re-ran that poll. What do you think the answer is today? Keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. In 2010, pollsters asked the country if it had become so divided that the national government could no longer solve major issues. 45% agreed with the statement, while 50% said that the nation could still unify despite its partisan differences. But when NBC News re-ran the question last year, some 70% said that polarization prevented Americans from solving problems, and only 27% said that unity was possible. In a new survey released this week by the polling form NORC, About 90% of both Republicans and Democrats said they believed that U.S. laws should be applied equally, that the government should be accountable to the people it represents, and multiple other principles. But only about a third of these people in each party believed that members of the other party held those same views, a sign of deep distrust between the parties. But going back to President Obama, he showed how you can fund a campaign on small dollar donations. Right. And like anything else, something that's successful gets copied. And that's one thing that Republicans are doing now. They're going after those small dollar donations. Why? Because that's where the money is. Well, what about all these big businesses that support them, Lance? So do they not, they can't get money there anymore? Well, they can. That's the other part of the show, right? That's the other part of the show. (laughs) But as you're you're talking about this divide, the point is, if you play up the divide, then you don't need the big business packs. You can go get the small donors and say, see, we're going to stand up against these progressive big businesses 
that are trying to control your life and we're not going to take their money. You send us your five, 10, 20, $50 donations and we'll fight for those American values that you hold near and dear to your heart. That's the push, right? That's what you just said. You push the divide and you can rake in enough money to get reelected and not sell your soul to big business. So they're turning, I mean, in some ways they're, they're shifting tactics here on big business, right? Of maybe, maybe we're better served with our base, you know, the, the elusive base, um, by turning away from big business. And I think this, this represents a larger trend well, too, which you, is you know, let, let, Let's try, you know, let's, let's attack Anheuser-Busch yeah. for what they're doing. Yet we're not going after all the beers that Anheuser-Busch sells. We're going to let you drink the ones you want, but see, we're strong on our American quote, American values, conservative American values. So, you know, instead of buying that case of Bud Light, send the 20 bucks to us. Isn't I, this, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's yeah, just, I know they're playing the game. Sure. Right. But that's what you well, said. That's what, but that's what, but that's what you, that's what parties do. That's why we can't, to your point, we don't come together yeah. is because they're playing up the riff. They're playing up the split, trying to drive that wedge even further so that they can get more money. And when they garner more money, they're more likely to win the majorities in the House and the Senate, which then does does it matter if you get the presidency? Well, that's the other thing. I mean, is there a new right? tact going on here? We get all excited about the presidency, but how much how how much of a difference does it make? The biggest place it might make a difference is your ability to appoint Supreme Court justices. I mean, that's been in the news, obviously, a lot right? Uh, with recent decisions over the past, I mean, what, like year and a half now. The president doesn't make you know, laws, their ability really has to do with how they can influence or lead, right, Congress. But if it's flipped, that's a pretty, because of the polarization, it's a pretty difficult Well, now we're looking at executive orders, which was right. the Obama way to get things done. That was and his, then, and then Trump the back did it. half of his first term and right. through his second term was mostly. And then by, you know, Trump did it. Now Biden's trying to do it in the Supreme Court's ruling on these negatively against these executive orders. Right. It's like, so, no, nope, can't do that. So who's going to be the bright to figure out a new way to get things done since Congress can't come well, together to write a law? And the other thing too, right, is we don't want, yeah, as a nation- aren't you tired of the country not moving? Be, yeah, we shouldn't I'm be relying on executive I'm tired of the country not moving orders. forward. Well, I understand that, but I'm tired of people arguing just for the sake of arguing and not solving any problems. Yep. I mean, whether we dig up more coal or- produce more oil or have more solar panels and more wind turbines. Can't we just do something about the energy? I mean, you know, we, we saw what the energy grid does is doing in Texas. We're what in a we really hot argue. summer. And all we do is yes. argue. Baker, right. Baker, Baker. We're not settling the problem. I mean, there are ways that I feel strongly about that we should solve it, but we just argue about it and it just continues to get worse. The article points out is one of the dangers for the ultimate nominees is that the sense of Malice that voters feel now could translate into a lack of enthusiasm at the polls in November when turnout could be a major factor in deciding the winner. But whose fault is that? Well, it's it's the parties that are nominating these candidates. No, it's the voters. Because why 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 do I say that? Because we're accepting this. We're saying you guys and gals go at each other, argue, be nasty, and the nastiest one is the one I'm gonna vote for. Yep. So we get what we ask for. You know, we, we sit here on one hand and say, well, we want to see something above board. We want honest. We want opinions. We want differences of opinions. And we want to see quality people. And then when they run, we don't vote for them. I think. So I, then what do we end up with? It's time that more people, right, of influence and persuasion throughout media admit what this article says, which is that what, well, it's just what you just said, just not that long ago. We're tired we're tired of these options, you know. I'm not we're, forget whether or not Biden or Trump or Hillary Clinton or whoever, right? Forget whether they're a good person or not. Just set that aside. We're just tired. These people have been around in the public life of America a long freaking time. 
You know, and you can say, well, Trump never held public. Yeah, but how, how long has Trump been a public figure in the United States? A long freaking time. Right. Well, and know? Biden was the vice time. president and, of Obama uh, right. for eight years. Well, and he so, was in the Senate and he ran for president before that. I mean, Biden's Biden's been around as long as Trump's been around in terms of the public sphere of, you know, politics. Trump's been around in a different era. But people, I think we are tired. We are worn out by seeing the answer that the parties are coming up with is we're going to bring you, like you said, somebody that is nastier or that is safer than the other person. That's what we got. That's it. The reason a third party can't win is because the two major parties don't have any interest in letting a third party into the race, you know, but there is some hope in this election for a potential new third party bid. Am I being overly optimistic when I say I don't think it'll be Trump, Biden in a year and a half? I hope not. I mean, if you were betting, would you bet on that? Or would you take the other other way? I'll give you the field. Mm. The field versus the field or Trump versus Biden. Where are you leaning right now in the summer, in the year before the election? Because remember, folks, it doesn't happen this year. Yeah, it, I know. It's a year. It's, it's November. <laughs> we got time. It's November a year from now. Yep. We got time. I'll take the field. And I think, but I'm, I'm afraid I'm being overly optimistic. Yeah. I think that there, if there ever was a time to take the field, you know, and say that despite the fact that the two party, the two parties are going to bullheadedly plow forward, right, with whatever they're going to do, you know. We don't care if Americans are apathetic. We don't care if they want somebody else. Because at the end of the day, if we make Trump the nominee or we make Biden the nominee, we just know that our people are going to show up to vote for him because they'll like our guy. They might not like our guy, but they're going to like the other guy less. You know, so who who freaking cares? I think at some point that strategy is going to bite the Democrats and the Republicans in the butt. And if there ever was a time, I think it's now because you don't even have to have somebody that's that exciting. You just have to have somebody that's not these people who's offering a optimistic, positive view of the future, not of the past, you know, and and I, that's why I think there's if there was ever a time statistically that there's a good opportunity for somebody to seize. Now is that time, because I think a youthful like if think about if like if you brought a you know, JFK or an Obama or somebody like that, right, in in their prime when they first ran for president, you bring somebody like that into this race right now, are you going to tell me that they don't, Republican, Democrat, whatever, you know, I think you got a lot of Americans that are going to be very interested in, in, in whatever that is, you know what I mean? Just because they're not almost 80 years old and they're not people that we've known for our whole freaking life, you know, who have either been in politics or been in the public eye forever. These are known factors. I mean, one of the things they said in the article is like, I'm tired already and it hasn't even started because I don't want to wa- I don't want to watch a replay of 2020. So what 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 solutions are there to this? We've talked about some of it, right? Keep it here on the state of us and we'll be right back. So there's a group that's been around for a while, about as long as we've been doing this show, actually, um, called No Labels. And we've had some of their uh, different leaders on the show at different times. And I think we're going to we're going to try to invite somebody back here soon to talk about what their plan is for 2024, because they're looking at this polling. Right. And, and their group is a nonpartisan group whose whole thing is like they're based in D.C. Right. Try to get Democrats and Republicans to work together for the common good. Well, what a what a crazy notion. Um, it's not a revolutionary notion, right? It just happens to be one that not a lot of people are seeming to, not a lot of lobbying groups are pushing forward. No Labels is saying, we're going to secure spots on the ballots in all these different states. Yeah, but states. the Republicans and Democrats are both fighting oh, No right. Labels in state courts mm-hmm. about their petitions. The one thing the Republican to, Party and the Democratic Party can agree on right now is that they don't like this No Labels thing that's happening, right? right? 
there and and that folks right there i think that tells you everything you need to know right about what lance and i've been saying for like the whole time we've done this show the parties have no interest no interest in a fair race in a fair race <laughs> none at all sorry right? i'm not trying to put words in your mouth because they don't, that's all i think they, of. Don't, want, they don't want they fair. don't even want no labels to be in the race right. they don't even want to let them participate you know it's it's not talk we'll, about american we, democracy we, we won't beat you we on the merits you we're just run. not going to let you in yeah we're just, nope 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 you know we have zero interest in letting you enter this race partly because i think what no labels has pitched is that you know if the two parties proceed down the path they're proceeding and if they put these two people forward again then we have every intention of bringing forward a, an alternative ticket you know and both parties, I imagine, hate that idea. And why Why would they hate that, right? I mean, if it was no risk. Well, because of the article we've been referencing on today's the show. The Libertarians nominate somebody every presidential election, right? You don't hear, you don't see the two parties getting all bent out of shape about that. Because why? They Because they know there's no chance, right? But the Green Party, the Libertarians, they're going to nominate, yeah, who freaking cares? You know, they're going to get one, if they're lucky, they'll get 1% or so of the popular vote and they're not going to win any states. So like, we don't care. But all of a sudden, there's this group that says, well, we're going to take a Republican and Democrat, put them on the same ticket, and we're going to run against these suckers. And now the parties are very interested in, well, we can't let that happen. We can't let them run. Scary. But it's going on. But should also tell you that apparently the parties think there's room for this to take off. Because why squash it if it's not a threat? I mean, who cares? Well, you I mean, you can challenge it, but at the end of the day, if you meet the requirements, we still live in a country where you have the right to put people on the ballot and you have the right to create a new political party and you have the right, you, you can do that. Oh, then things. it gets fun. Let's say they take a third party, whoever it is, takes California and New York and nobody gets the 270. Do we have a process for that, Lance? We do. Oh, we do? Yeah, but you, you weren't okay. alive then. It was yeah. back... It was back when I was alive, at the turn of the century. Okay, <laughs> two centuries ago. <laughs> two right to turn, two two turns ago. <laughs> this, back when you were the hit CBS around. show Ghost. Back when those okay. guys were alive, you know that 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 took place. Yeah, but we have had that happen before, right? Yes, we have. It doesn't happen very often, and the only thing that history tells us about that is that who knows what will happen exactly. if nobody gets two seventy. Nobody knows. Nobody really has any idea then nope. what will take place, especially with uh, the Congress that we the have. The makeup of Congress. Well, I, <laughs> and as you you know, pointed out every once in a while that when the House of Representatives votes, it's one vote per state. Yeah, it's not everybody, you know, it gets, for those that don't remember, if nobody gets 270 electoral votes, right, then Congress is tasked, the House of Representatives specifically, not the Senate, the House of Representatives is tasked with electing the president and they don't get one vote for one member. They get one vote for their state. So the entire delegation of each state votes with a single vote. So where are they getting all this money? Who's that? Anybody to run. Well, we've, we've known for years, right, that big corporations usually support the GOP, the Republicans. Typically, historically. But according to this article in the Wall Street Journal... A rift is widening between the GOP and big corporate donors. Once considered natural political allies, the Republican Party and big business are drifting apart. GOP lawmakers are weaning themselves off money from corporate political action committees. Republicans are now less dependent on corporate and industry PACs than at any time in the past three decades. Where are they getting their money? They're turning to smaller donations from millions of individuals who tend to be wary of big businesses' priorities, such as free trade. What do you think of that? Well, I mean, this I new group of Republicans, and for example, right, to give you, you know how much I like anecdotal evidence here, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has lived through this change. In the 2016 election, he received more than 40% of his campaign reelection money from business PACs. In 2022, McCarthy became the Speaker of the House with only 3% of his campaign funds coming from corporate money, from 40% to 3% yeah. in six years. 
Big change. I mean, are they are they are they using the Obama method? You know that I mentioned earlier in the show when you brought this up. You know, we're going after the small time donors because, according to the article. They're taking up these causes once associated with old school Democrats, advancing bills that give more power to the federal government to raise wages for blue collar workers and lower drug costs for consumers. Why are they doing this? Because within the Republican Party, this is from the article now, these stances are taking place because the Republican Party increasingly represents less educated, blue-collar workers in rural areas who often tend to hold more conservative views on these liberal issues that big business is pushing. It all goes back to, I mean, I just wrote this down, Lance, frustrated voters. You might say, well, what do you mean? Well, there are actions and reactions, right? Companies over the past five, 10 years have started to become much more active historically than they used to be on social-based issues, right? Well, we've That's talked just about reality. That. Younger workers want to because work for a company right, who, that reflects their values. Exactly. So right. there's been this there's been this push. If you're and, looking and for a labor workers, shortage, what do you right. have to do? You're you're tailoring to their expectations. So we find that younger workers want to work for companies that favor their values. So companies start taking value-based stances, which again, historically in American business was less common. Most of the time it was, you know, we're, if we, if we're involved in politics, it's quietly and it's behind the scenes, it's not public and we don't take big public stances. We're not going to take a public stance, right? Yep. Well, and, and rarely did companies, even when they were involved in politics, it was a lot of times it was for business interest, right? It wasn't for social issues. It was, you know, well, we're backing this candidate because they have this initiative that we think is positive for American business. Well, like Donald Trump, when he was a businessman, yeah, he donated equally to Democrats and Republicans so he could have well, good business. a voice right. no matter who got in. Yeah. He could go to them and ask them for a favor. Yeah. I mean, that's just common what, practice. That's what business did. So what changed? Well, the, the demand of younger workers. Well, what what combines with that is the people that are most likely to get hired by these big name companies, right, where the values matter to them getting hired tend to be white collar, corporate, and a lot of more high tech or skilled jobs, quote unquote, skilled jobs that require some degree of higher education. Well, as the country well, you has also shifted, said younger workers, uh, right. I mean, they're younger naturally. But it's like on this show. We tease each other back and forth. Our views aren't totally different, but the average right. 60 year old plus versus the average millennial are going to have different views. They're going to have different views on solar energy, on abortion, on you know all of these hot button issues. And it's like, well, I've got to get younger workers, but when I do that, the people who buy my products, I could be turning them off by taking these social stances. And the Republicans are playing that up to get money from these smaller donors. The biggest failure of the Democratic Party, in my opinion, in the past decade, is the failure to recognize the shift in frustration of non-urban non-urban traditional voters, right? Non-urban and non-suburban voters. Your rural or rural suburban voters are upset. They became upset in part because all this stuff happens with the economy. The world has changed a lot, right? We're moving toward tech. And a lot of them feel left out, left behind, or not spoken to. And Lance and I, I mean, we're recording this show from one of those places where I think there's a lot of people who feel that way. People don't like to feel ignored. They hate to feel ignored. And the biggest failure of the Democratic Party, in my opinion, over the past decade is the failure to recognize that that shift happened and then to do anything to speak to those voters. The Republicans, on the other hand, we've always talked about they like to win, right? They've detected that this change is taking place and they've decided to seize upon it 
If you had asked 40 years ago if it was likely that the Republican Party would become the populist party of the United States, I think a lot of people probably would have said, no, you know, that's their, it's almost the opposite. They're kind of the more elite party and the Democrats are a bit more of the populist party. And now it's almost as if what's happening is that's shifting, right? If you don't say the right things, if you don't act the right way, you're not part of the Democratic Party. We might even kick you out, you know? And, but if you don't talk right, speak right, if you're the the quote unquote perceived every man, then we're going to talk to you as the Republican Party. Now, mind you that I'm not sure that either party is actually doing a lot for their respective voters, right? I'm not contending that they're actually serving them, but they are. But who's pretending to listen right. better? But Yeah, but who's <laughs> pretending to listen better? And the Democrats are failing miserably at pretending even to give a damn about what's happened to this group of Americans that's substantial enough to win the presidency, right? I mean, we saw that in 2016. There's enough of them coupled with enough of the people that will always vote Republican to take the White House under the system that we have. So it's not like this ain't nobody that are upset, you know, and no, maybe they're not upset for the, you know, quote unquote, right reasons or justified, but they are frustrated. The economy has changed on them. And if you don't speak to them, you lose them. And especially if somebody else speaks to them. So no, Trump's never been one of those people, you know, he has never lived that life. He's not lived the rural life. He's not lived the poor life. He's not lived the factory life. He's not lived the everyman life, but he did the thing that the, that the Democrats managed to bungle for two elections in a row, which is to talk to those people and, and not only talk to them, but say, you're my people and I'm going to fight for you. Whether I actually do or not. Right. Whether I do or not is At least I'm telling material. you that you guys are important to you, me. Somebody. Oh, wow. Somebody. And then they. Somebody turn, important is saying that we're important. Right. A huge part of elections is feeling heard. And I think, and that's the message for this election is that voters right now do not feel heard by what the parties are doing. And that's, there's the opening, right? The same thing that Trump seized on the first time round. He doesn't have that same, that quite that same advantage the second time around. I mean, you got your diehards, but for the people that are questioning whether or not that's the right choice, there's this opening for that energy to come through of, I hear that Americans are upset with the current parties and the current options, and we're going to do something different. Time will tell. Time will tell. Why do we have this show today, Lance? Because True Chat, where we work, has a mission. <laughs> And that mission is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. And if you've listened to today's show, please tell your family and friends, get them to listen, tell them they can find us as a podcast on Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcast, and everywhere podcasts are found. State of Us releases new episodes on Tuesdays and Thursdays, first thing in the morning as a podcast. Those same episodes are heard on the weekends on AM and FM radio stations across the United States and parts of Canada. For the State of Us, I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to recording producer Levi LaForge and senior producer Bradley Butch. And of course, thank you, our audience, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in thestateofus.org.